Welcome to Budget TV and today we have a special episode where we're meeting with Tim Solms who is a businessman and also the owner of his own private jet and he's going to tell his story of how he went from being um, in the army to then flying helicopters in the army, spending 19 years in the US Army and then moving into the business world and moving his way up to be able to buy himself his own private jet which he flies himself. So we're going to be talking about that in this episode, finding out what things that Tim has learned along the way and if you are looking to buy your own jet and you don't quite know how or how to make the money at the end he gives some great advice on how you can go out there and deliver value enough to be able to afford not only to buy your own private jet but also to operate it now before we get into the interview with Tim uh, get yourself a copy of the quantum economy uh, my latest book is just out it's about business trends this is the future and of course how private jet is playing and will be playing a very important role in the life of the entrepreneur so you need to get yourself a copy if you're an entrepreneur if you've already got a copy uh, please post a review and if you need a copy just click on the link below which will take you straight to uh, where you can buy yourself a, a hard copy of the quantum economy which is available worldwide by the way uh, now let's get into today's interview with tim Solms. let's see what he has to say and find out about his success success story which is always inspiring for all of us so off we go Welcome, Tim, to the show. Thank you for your time. Uh, you've got a great story to tell. And um, let's start with you joining the Army as, as a helicopter pilot. Uh, what motivated you to make that decision at such a young age? Well, joining the Army and becoming a helicopter pilot are two points in time that are very far apart. I grew up in a military family. I had been around it my entire life. And I showed some interest in that, uh, was looking at attending the military academy and wound up going to the Citadel. But as I was as I was headed down that path, my father wisely said to me, hey, if you're serious about a career of service, you need to know that you've only seen one side of it. He was a, a colonel at the time. And I spent some time with his uh, senior enlisted advisor, his sergeant major. And I wound up enlisting in the Army at 17. and okay. uh, well, and spent time as an enlisted soldier and then stayed in the reserves through my um, my college university years. So okay. that parlayed into being commissioned as a lieutenant in the field artillery, was okay. all in, was a, was, a, was a gunner, as you Brits say. And uh, yeah. as I was on a deployment and out of the blue, got a call from the chief of army aviation while I was in a tactical environment and said, hey, I'm sitting here looking at your file, and I'd like to know if you'd be interested in, uh, in in taking a look at Army Aviation. I had an older brother who was one of the first Apache pilots, and I'm oh. standing there in a I'm standing there in a tent looking at my commanding officer, and everyone can hear the conversation because it's over a, a radio. And I said, "Sir, yeah. may I call you back later?" <laughs> and yeah. and okay. so I, I wound up going to flight school. And uh, how old you? I, how old you when you went to flight school? Oh, gosh, I went to flight school at, uh, I was 25, 26 years old when I went to flight school. Okay. So oh. I, I was a brand new captain. I'd been, a, I always joke and say I'd been a captain for about an hour and a half. And, yeah. um, uh, but had a, had a lot of uh, army experience at that point, which, which helped because I, I yeah. brought a lot of what I would call, um, you know, army troop leading experience uh, into the cockpit and into the unit. That gets very interesting. You know, um, I talk about the organization I was I was uh, fortunate enough to command Blue Max, and we'll come back to that later. But when I was the yeah. commander, I was commander of the of the unit. I was also the least experienced Apache pilot in the in the organization. So that uh, that made for a unique learning and leading experience for me. Oh wow, interesting. So, what was the most challenging situation you got into while you were deployed flying Apache helicopters, and how did you win over that situation? Yeah challenge yeah well yeah, that's an interesting question my, my most challenging situation is this one won't be what you expect it actually wasn't in the apache it was deployed during the fight in the balkans it was in the war in kosovo okay. i okay. was there in a nato i was in there in a nato billet and the reason that it was the most challenging was because i was not in a u.s environment i was in a multinational environment and what i had to learn and unlearn very quickly were national agendas and national styles to say hey i'm I'm sitting here in a in a in a you know a blown out building uh, on a on a very muddy hilltop in Pristina, Kosovo, with 36 other nations, and we have to figure out how we're going to do this together, and not make it about uh, what my country wants or your country wants. So I learned a lot about uh, 
working in the international environment and f- really finding the best in people um, and looking past some of the uh, some of the obstacles that we may see from our cultural upbringing and background. And it was a it was probably the the biggest learning experience I had as a soldier. So you're saying that the the main thing there was you needed to listen and you needed to understand the other I learned a lot about people and I learned a lot about culture and that's really what's carried me through from the military into business. Yeah. Okay. So and 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 making that kind of transition, what are the three main things you learned in the military that you have taken with you into your business life? Yeah, number one is the importance of culture and mission focus, right? And those are those are so closely aligned. Uh, mm-hmm. The second thing is what to look for in great people, and those mm-hmm. and I and I my list of what to look for in great people are really smart, very creative, and with the ability to turn ideas into action quickly. And then mm-hmm. the last thing is keep fighting, don't give up, right? Even when you know, hey, we were informed that we lost this to uh, this bid proposal. Well, that doesn't mean it's over. It means you have to come find a more creative way to go at it. And uh, yeah. I'd say those are those are the those are the three things that I took away the most. And as I'm sitting there reflecting, I try not to tell a lot. You know, in the business environment, I try not to tell a lot of you know there I was stories or use my hands or shooting at my watch. Um, but those are the those are the ideas that play in the back of my head. And and the umbrella over all of that is. Um, the gratitude of being allowed to lead an organization and knowing that it's temporary. The history is with organizations, not with people. So I get a moment in time where I'm, I'm allowed to lead an organization or a group of people and try to leave uh, positive footprints and fingerprints and, and, and not, and not do damage. Good, good. Now tell us about how you transitioned out of the military into the business life. Now here in England, for example, they actually a friend of mine has got a charity where he helps People leave the forces and come into uh, civilian life, which I understand, not being a military person myself, that this transition can be difficult for some people. Oh, it can um, be very difficult. You, the, the things yeah. that make you successful in the military are not the things that make you successful in business. Now, the concepts yeah. are, but, uh, yeah. you know, attention to detail, finding the best in people, taking care of people. Right? Those are those are all part and parcel of what makes you successful. So, so Tim, how, how did you, how did you make that? So you left the military well, after 19 years, you were, you were in there, right? Yeah, I, I was, I was, I, and every, anyone who was in the U S military is like, you left that close to 20 years. And, and the answer was, yes, I did. I was, I was just back from a deployment. Uh, mm-hmm. I was getting ready to head off to school. Uh, I had spent some time in the Pentagon, which I'll be honest, I, did not like um, being in the Pentagon. I used to, I, I jokingly said it, my first day there, I felt like somebody sucked all the air out of my lungs. I much okay. prefer the operational side of the military, but I, I value um, what, what the Pentagon does and why it's there. Yeah. And was told, yep, you're going to go to school for a year. It's a huge, huge win for you. Congratulations. This is a big deal. But then you're probably going to go back to the Pentagon. <laughs> I said, I bet I don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I, I, I had a call uh, again out of the blue, you know, like I do when I wound up becoming an aviator was the, the, the man who was running the federal business in a, in a technology company who said, hey, I was at a dinner last night and somebody was talking to me about you and I asked for your contact information. I wanted to see if you were interested in, in coming to work. And I said, um, no, <laughs> I'm not. I'm just back from a deployment. I'm in the car driving to my next duty station with my family. And, uh, and, and he says, ah, I'm gonna let you think about it. And called me back three days later and said, Hey, I just like to fly you out for a day just so we can have a chance to talk. And I, and I wound up taking him up on that offer. I met absolutely amazing people. It was not at all what I expected. Again, I grew up in the military that I had, yeah. I had lived inside that microcosm from day one. And, uh, yeah. and, and at the end of that, I'm like, where do I sign up? I, I, you know, that company, fortunately, their, their strategy back then was just hire, you know, people that had attributes that they were looking for, throw them in the deep end. So of why, why did the technology company want you from the military? Is there something in the military you did with technology that, that qualified I, you or was it I your was personality? Always fascinated by technology. You know, it's the, the technology of the Apache is what really drew me to it, right? Um, the, you know, the, okay. obviously the mission, but I was fascinated with technology, but no, it was a, it was a, a an intersection in time. And, yeah. you know, 
I, I look at, you know, I, it's, it's not stalking when it's research, Fabrizio. Yeah. So when I looked at yeah. you and looked through your background, you know, I, again, you see an opportunity and, you know, is this an opportunity that I take and run with or is, or do I go a different direction? And uh, all, all of my background was, this is an opportunity to jump on and run hard. And yeah, just like I did as a, as a young aviator and as a young soldier, it was, I don't have the background here, but I know if I can watch and see and be very attentive, play my part in the culture, put my head down and deliver results, I can, I can learn a lot and then see what happens next. And so that's, yeah. that was the beginning of the, of my sort of career in technology. Okay. So you got into technology and then developed into a bit of an expert in fintech, cybersecurity technology. Um, and how did you develop this skill set and become a true linchpin, let's call it? Um, yeah. Um, so tell us that. So you come out of the military, you join this technology yeah. company, and then you kind of develop into this, this, this consultant entrepreneur and that. So tell us a bit about that journey. It, it was... Again, I think it goes back to those things that I talked to you about inside the military. You know, it was yeah. how how to find great culture, right? How to how to how to keep people focused on a on a north star. What is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish? Don't give me fifteen things I'm trying to track. Give me three with an ultimate yeah. goal. And in that, I became I. I I stumbled into, I worked for a very large uh, software company and it turned out to be a turnaround in, uh, situation. I did not know that going in. And, okay. and when I got in there, I within 72 hours, I said, this, is, this requires a turnaround. I've since learned to say, hey, this is, requires a re-optimization for growth. Like, let's look at the resources. Let's figure out what we're doing here. Let's get people organized so that we're all about growth. Some of that is changing. What are the metrics we're going to use? And so I, I developed uh, skills in re-optimizing organizations for growth. And that has been my sort of playbook since that time, where whether it's working with a private equity firm or being asked to do consulting, we all have our side hustles, right? Yep. Uh, it, you, it, it is always where somebody says, we have a great, we have a gem here, but it, it just needs to be re-optimize if we need to point it towards growth we need to polish it we need to we need to get it performing and delivering to its potential yeah so, that, so that you kind of fell my, into this so you fell into I, this situation with a software company you figured i can make things better and as you made I, things better you actually turned the company around and said oh i've actually got a knack for this well i won't say i turned the cup around my little piece of that company right so again i'm yeah. I, I try to be i try to be very grateful but again i, I also look for opportunity the other piece of that is to say, okay, I've now learned what I can learn here. I've done what I can do here. It's, you know, it's time for me to go find another opportunity because if my skill set really is in that sort of let's re-optimize for growth, let's let's take a an undervalued asset and and get it up to delivering uh, to its to its level of value and potential and then beyond and grow, you say, okay. Let's do some mergers and acquisitions and, and develop some skill there, looking for smart people that are very creative, that are good at ideas into action. And then from there, uh, you, you know, looking for that next opportunity. Good, good. So tell us about your experience turning companies and projects around. Tell us about a few other situations where you went in and turned around and how you did it, because this is our audience likes these kind of stories. And then we'll get yeah. on to the, the jet bit. <laughs> well, so first, first of all, it's a it. it it, it's it's very humbling for me when you say that because I don't feel like I'm that person. I I get to come in and be a fresh set of eyes to say, hey, I think I see something here. And uh, you know, I will tell you the 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 earlier version of me made a lot of mistakes. You know, and and made a lot of mistakes that um, you know where where it had direct impact on people. And I learned very very quickly that hey, these you know what what needs to happen here is we need to bring focus. We need to bring deliberate action. We need to measure. Uh, a, a great person with whom I uh, was chairman of a board uh, of a company I was in said, if you can measure it, you can improve it. Right. Yeah. So how can we, how can we measure? What are the things, what are those key things we need to measure? And I, I never walk in and say, what are those key performance indicators? I, I say, I, I, I let that team come up with what those KPIs are. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. You all tell me what are the most important things we do here. And if we did something a little bit differently, how much more growth could we get? Um, you know, the, uh, I, had a, I had a commander in the military, went on to be a two-star general, wound up commanding field artillery. And, and he, one of the things that he used to say was, it takes a, just an incremental bit of additional effort to go from good to great. Um, now, delivering results can be different, but to get an organization from good to great doesn't take that much more effort. Um, True. Keeping it there is a different story. So watching out for fatigue and staying close to people and making sure that um, they can sustain what, what, what it is that we're, we are co-developing and co-putting in place is a key part of that. Um, but that's, that's been, I'd say, the, you know, that, that linchpin, that turning point to say how we can make, how we can get companies in there to improve. And, and, it, and it's not for everybody. It's not always, you know, it's not always a great fit. Um, you know, I've, I've learned to listen a lot more. I've learned to be available a lot more. I will not go into an office and work in, in, a, in an office behind a door. I will not do that. Yeah. Uh, if I'm going to take the time to commute and, and being in Washington, D.C., you know, I'm always surrounded by lawyers and politicians. So if I'm going to if I'm going to run that gauntlet to get to an office, I'm going to sit in a common area where if somebody wants to come and sit down and chat, I'm, I'll make myself available for that. Right. Because I'm re I'm literally there to be with that group of people. Yeah. So tell us about so you when you left the military. You did you continue flying right away or did you have a period where yeah. you weren't right? And then what got you got you back into flying? Well, no, I did. And, and it's funny. I, I've always loved flying. I've always been fascinated with it from, you know, as a child, I never thought it would be something I could do. I always thought mm -hmm. that's what smart people did. That's what successful people did. I never saw it as something I, I'd be able to do. Flying in the military was um, what was a was an absolute gift. Uh, the people and the, the equipment that we got to use was just it's, it's a it's a pivotal point in your life where you're flying the best of what's available in the world with the best people in the world. Uh, and you know, and and so I one of the, I got my commercial helicopter instrument license as a byproduct of going to uh, Army Flight School uh, okay. down um, in Alabama. Okay. Um, just an extra Saturday at a barbecue place. And at the day we got our wings, half of us who had taken a weekend to do that also got handed an FAA certificate. I'm like, oh, I have this FAA certificate. So uh, at, a, at a duty station I had later on, it was, oh, I could go with, with you know, X number of hours of instruction and a few hours of solo, I can add my fixed wing rating onto this. So I did okay. and loved it. Just loved being able to fly for myself and not uh, in a professional environment and continue to do that. Had a small Grumman Cheetah uh, when I was um, when I was still in the Army and an AA-5A. Yeah. Um, from that, shortly after I got out of the Army um, and was and family was getting larger, I, I moved to a Cherokee 6, right? The, okay. You know, and, um, and flew that like crazy. And that's what I used to get from place to place. And I and I immediately started using it for business. Okay. And then um, I, I moved up from, from there to a Piper Malibu and then from there to a Honda Jet. So basically your, your business um, endeavors allowed you to be able to afford to, to you know, start moving up and, and eventually get into a Honda Jet. Well, I'd say, yes, they, they allowed it, but they had also created the demand for that. Um, I can tell you right now, I'm flying a Honda jet right now, mm -hmm. but if I had a, if I was working, you know, if I had something that was, you know, uh, a 40 minute flight away and I thought I was going to be doing that twice a week, the Honda jet would not be the right aircraft for that, for that mission set. Right. I, I look for something else, but as it is right now, I, I saw a, a pivot point during COVID where as everything slowed down, I said, I, this is an opportunity for me to speed up. And so I went from spending a lot of time on the commercial airlines to, I was flying, I was flying my plane probably a hundred, 120 hours a year. I immediately went to 260 to 280 to, you know, 280 hours a year. Um, and that's when I moved to the, the Piper Malibu, great platform, pressurization, flying in the flight levels, complex, you know, and, and learn that. But, but I realized very quickly that, I was flying that aircraft right to the edge of the performance envelope almost every time. Yeah. And the, the, my business requirements were going to keep me on that trajectory. And so how, I, did, how did you have the Piper Malibu for then? Uh, I had it for two years. Oh, okay. 
and flew it for two years. And, um, and as I was looking for the next platform, I thought, you know, perhaps TBM, uh, would be the right next platform. And when I started looking at acquisition costs and I started looking at capabilities, absolutely fantastic aircraft that, uh, yeah. that the French produce, yeah. um, Another gentleman uh, with whom I was in business previously said, "Hey, he, fl he flies a, a Citation Mustang." He said, "You yeah. should probably you should take a look." Okay. And he educated me quite a bit. I hopped on YouTube and started doing quite a bit of research, and yeah. um, and made the decision at that point to to look closely at the Honda Jet and start pulling data and to see if it would be compelling and it would align to the needs of uh, my business. So, did you buy the Honda Jet new, or did you buy it pre-owned? Uh, I bought it pre-owned. Um, mm -hmm. I, I bought it pre-owned from the factory. Okay. Uh, that seemed to be the best bet. Okay. Um, it, during that process, I got a little insight that the Elite 2 would be coming out. Yeah. Um, and I had taken a position there. As yeah. I saw some changes in the economy, I actually withdrew that position because I thought holding on to cash would be a better move for, yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was able to negotiate very handsomely with a with the the factory as I bought that aircraft, and you know, with with so few units out there, so few tail numbers out there right now, it's it, working with Hanajet is very it's very bespoke. Um, so they individually, we want to make this the best experience for you that we can. Um, so they did some upgrades to the aircraft. Uh, they wanted to make sure that my that I had an easy spot that was available for my type rating. Yeah. And uh, I've continued to stay in touch with them probably on a weekly basis. Okay, that's good. So how long have you had the airplane now? About a year? Is it? Uh, just a little over a year. Yeah, I'd probably call it um, 15, 16 months. Yeah. yeah. So how have you been using the Honda Jet then for your business? Obviously, you, the range covered where you need to go. Uh, so you're mainly going around up and down the East Coast, is it? Yeah, I'd say from the um, from the north, uh, you know, for, for, when, I, when I look in the in the, sort of the Ohio Valley region, you know, I'd say from probably the tip of Michigan through Texas and up and down the East Coast, um, quite a, quite a bit up and down the East Coast, as a matter of fact. Um, but the interesting piece there, though, is it's a very different kind of flying. So mm -hmm. I started flying the Honda Jet the way I would fly a Cherokee Six or or mm -hmm. uh, you know the Malibu. And quickly realized, oh no, that monetarily does not make sense. I'm not going to go hop in and pick up a daughter and fly her somewhere else. And you know, because you're you're counting cycles and you're counting hours, and that and and so I've I've learned quickly uh, to focus it to the mission side of the business. And what does the business demand? And I'd say I'm 80 percent of my hours are business hours, and about 20 percent are for you know personal and family. Yeah. Okay, so so I guess if the range increases for your business, then you're going to have to get a bigger plane. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, I I really love the platform. Um, Honda Jet has given us a, a little bit of a teaser on something larger uh, that would certainly make um, getting yeah. across getting across yeah. the Atlantic Ocean uh, feasible, and I'll, I'll keep a very close eye on that. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I found the platform very compelling. Uh, so. I talked about flying the Apache. I flew an A model Apache. If you talk to any A model Apache pilots, you know the cockpit. When I when I was going through the the Army's version of that type rating, the qualification course, the first thing they said is, "This aircraft is incredibly easy to fly, but you are the integrator of incredible amounts of disparate information." It was yeah. not a it was not a um, what you consult. You know, it was not a clean cockpit. You know, there was different. Aviation systems, you know, flight systems, weapon systems, communication systems, nav systems, forward looking infrared, and you had to synthesize all that information. So a two hour flight would absolutely wear you out. Yeah. Whereas I'll do a four, four and a half hour flight right now in the Honda Jet, and I will feel refreshed. I will feel rested when I finish that flight, um, as opposed to the aircraft that I had before, where, you know, four or five hour flight, you needed a nap. That's not the way it is at all with this platform. So that the way that, and that is, that is really an important point because for example, there's always a debate, what's better Boeing or Airbus. And I'm a big Boeing pilot. I know I've flown Airbus, but friends of mine that flown both, they said, well, you do a 10 hour duty on a, on a Boeing compared to an Airbus um, where you fly maybe four sectors a day on the Airbus, you'll come, you'll get home a lot more rested because the workload is less because yeah. there's more information. Um, you press a button and it will do three things for you. While in a Boeing, you got to press three buttons. Exactly. Um, 
And so technology is really, really important. So when you are thinking of buying an airplane, especially if you're going to fly it yourself, and even if you've got two pilots up front that are going to be flying you, um, the technology can make a big difference in, you know, relieving the pilots from potential fatigue, uh, wow. which is a big killer and has been a killer for a number of years in a lot of accidents. And it boils down to, okay, it was the human factor. Okay, well, within the human factor, what was the fact, the determining factor that caused the accident while well, the pilot was fatigued? Um, so, and fatigue is not only, you know, the plane, it's, you know, where they're well rested, how many hours have they flown the, the day before or the week before, you know, there's a whole number of things that play into it, but Absolutely. if you are operating an aircraft, which is easy to fly, um, and has a certain level of automation, which, you know, increases your situation awareness, takes stress away, um, gives you more energy mentally to cope with situations. Um, you know, I, I think that's really, really a, an important factor. So, and these new aeroplanes with all the technology like the Garmin 3000 that you have yeah. up on in the, um, in the Honda jet, which is also used in the, in the Phenom 100 and 300s and also in the CJ series built by, by Cessna. Um, certainly what I'm hearing, having never flown Garmin avionics before myself, but what I'm hearing is a lot of people say they're absolutely fantastic. Well, it is. And, and the interesting thing about the Garmin 3000 that you mentioned, so I fly the Honda Jet version of the Garmin 3000, whereas the 3000 and, the, and you know, in the other air platforms are, are a little bit different. It is yeah. tied into every system on the aircraft. So it's all centrally managed. Uh, when I was flying that, that Piper Malibu, I was flying the Mirage, the piston engine version of that. The, yeah. uh, it, I had, it had been previously retrofitted for a Garmin glass cockpit and having that experience is really what pushed me to say, I, uh, I'm looking for a similar experience. And so when I was looking at, you know, light jets and I was looking at the premier one, a, I was looking at the Mustang and, and it was, uh, my familiarity and experience with Garmin that made the Honda jet very compelling for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes, it makes sense because you should feel yeah. the experience you already got. You don't have to relearn something, uh, yeah. which I think is really, really important. And I'll, when I went through the type rating, I, my SIM partner was a former, uh, uh um, space shuttle pilot. Oh, and uh, older gentleman. And it was interesting to me how as smart as he was that he struggled a little bit with the automation of the aircraft. Was he buying the plane himself or was he, doing the rating for somebody else. No, no, he was going through and getting fractional. He, he, he went into the, he bought a position with a fractional. Um, uh, so he could do some flying as well. Yeah. So okay. he could do some flying. And, and phenomenal, I mean, phenomenal experience, uh, but, but we were able to, and we still stay in touch. And one of the things that he says, he watches some of my YouTube videos, which I appreciate, uh, but he uses Microsoft flight simulator quite a bit to help keep those systems fresh. Cause he's not flying as much as he used to be. Yeah, Which yeah, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, and and I think you know Microsoft Flight Simulator has come a long way over the last few years. Absolutely, it has. It's a, it is probably fifty percent of the questions that I get uh, on YouTube are from people that are are using the HoddaJet in Flight Simulator. Yeah, and I'm surprised that flight schools these days aren't using simulators more than they, 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 they could, than they could be. Well, they're certainly um, using them more than when I went and learned to fly. No, I mean, today you can basically, I mean, if I was to set up my own flight school, I would teach in, in one of these modern simulators with, with the visuals. I teach my students all the maneuvers in that. And then we'll go in the airplane. When they've mastered the maneuver in the simulator, we go in the airplane and actually do it. Well, um, the, the type rating in the Honda jet is you have never been in the aircraft. Where do you get type rated? Well, same here. I when I flew the 737, you know, I jumped in an airplane in Manchester airport, flew away to Canary Islands. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've done some landings because here in England, you have to do six takeoffs and landings when you do a, a heavy jet. Uh, so I did those. But then the actual real flight I did was a four and a half hour flight to the Canary Islands and then landed. Um, and that was a real landing with, with passengers on board. So, you know. Well, the second, the second part of that is the mentor pilot piece. And that's usually a insurance driven requirement. For me, I was uh, I was given 35 hours of mentor pilot time. I chose mm -hmm. to do my mentor pilot time before I went to my type rating. I wanted to be very familiar with the aircraft and the systems before I got there. Uh, that turned out to have been a, a, you know, a very good path for me personally. You did this in your own airplane. So you took delivery of the airplane without having the rating. That's brought correct. Brought in the pilot because yep. you flew to a single pilot and then you flew with him before you went. That's a good idea actually. Well, and I would use two, two different mentor pilots and, and, and this was by design. One former Navy F-18 pilot rated in the jet 
very operational focus on how he instructed uh, the other the other person with whom I used um, rated in the aircraft an instructor, but also um, rated as a, as an A and P in the Honda jet. And okay. he took a very systems related approach. And so working with both of them, and I split my hours between uh, those two those two mentors really gave me some some different benefits. And and those are the people with whom I'm working now, as we're helping the Honda jet owners and pilots association focus on. A, you know, how do we get better, uh, safer? Uh, how do we engage better with the insurance agencies, et cetera? And, and, I'm, and those two are a big part of helping with that. Yeah, yeah, because that's the other thing that you are also uh, chairman, correct, of the Honda Pilots? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm just a member of that board, which, uh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. nice. Uh, the, the, yeah. I, I would not want to be the president of that board right now. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very busy time, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to participate, and I was glad to be asked. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, that, and, and what they do is basically just coordinate things and make things easier for Honda Jet Pilot uh, owners, correct? Right, and also to bring um, to bring visibility to issues, whether it be maintenance issues, safety issues, to participate in that community and get that community conversation going, and then also uh, give back, um, bringing a singular voice back to the back to the factory. You know, the, the beauty of having a jet clean sheet designed by an automobile, you know, somebody who's historically an autom automobile manufacturer, there was a lot of thought and intentionality that went into that, and then. We we all want somebody designed like that, but then we want to work with a company that that maybe is a little bit more focused on aviation. So the the fact of the matter is, is we have a very good experience, and Honda Aircraft Company is very good about listening to the users. And they're I, mean, I think that's important. And I think two things that they've done, which have been very clever. First of all, they took ten years to get this airplane certified because they wanted to get it right. And the second thing is the factory is in the US. Yes. Where there's a lot of, you know, people with experience in building airplanes. Yep. Um, and of course, there's a massive market for it because, you know, most sure. people buying a Honda jet are people like yourself. They're entrepreneurs that fly. Um, right. And the biggest market for entrepreneurs that fly is the US market. Um, I mean, I remember talking to another manufacturer, and I won't name who, about having a factory in the US. Um, it was with Scott and I were planning on doing this. And they just said, no. I said, do you realize how many more aircraft you'll sell if you do this? Nope, not interested. But well, that, the right thing. And that market demand, I think you're right, is very compelling. And I give a lot of credit to Honda Aircraft Company for making that decision yeah. and for, you know, continuing down that path. So we get, when I, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about culture, right? So yeah. the best of that, that, you know, that, um, automobile manufacturing culture now combining with the best of the aviation culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, and of course, and Honda aircraft company is an independent company, part of the Honda yeah. family. Um, I mean, look what they did with, look what they did with engines where they said, Hey, a lot of fantastic engines out there, but we're looking for something a little different. So they, you know, they built a separate company as a, you know, in cooperation with GE. So GE, Honda, you know, aero and, yeah. developed a, a brand new engine and yeah. that, that engine so far has been absolutely bulletproof. It's been fantastic. Um, very efficient. Uh, and, and the, you know, the power out of those has been fantastic. Yeah. And of course the design uh, with the engines mounted on top of the wing is very unusual. It's originally a German design uh, that Honda took inspiration from, um, yeah, and uh, from an aerodynamics and also from a noise perspective, I mean, yeah. a number of Honda jet owners have said to me, I can hear what people are saying in the cabin from the cockpit. Yeah. It's that good. Yeah. My wife and daughter say it's very comfortable back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. I don't, I don't know. It's got, it's got a proper toilet as well, even though it's a small airplane. It does. Uh, flush toilet, which is which is handy. And, and that baggage compartment at the back. Um, yeah, it's exceptional. Yeah, yeah. I always say it's got that Harry Potter effect where it looks really small from outside, but when you get in it, it the, you know, you can comfortably sit in there, six people, and 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 have your baggage compartment full of bags and golf clubs and whatever else you want to carry. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great it's, utility aircraft and uh, exceptionally well designed. It's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure to fly. But yeah, I want to I want to make sure you know I, I one of the reasons that I started filming my flights. One, my father is absolutely yeah. fascinated by it, and uh -huh. 
you know, he's at an age and stage now where getting in and out of the cockpit isn't quite as easy. And I just wanted to share those flights with him. I had no idea that people were going to watch it and start yeah. asking, you know, a, a lot of questions, but that's been fun for me. Yeah. But it also gives me an opportunity to watch my flights and be very critical. Uh, yeah. And I find myself sometimes saying, hey, maybe I want to edit this piece out. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm going to leave it in. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm only going to stay humble and, and safe if I actually leave this in. And um, Yeah. So I, those of you watching, uh, click on the link below and it'll take you to, Tim's YouTube channel. You can watch him flying the Honda jet from A to B to C to D. Um, and uh, that's interesting. So when you fly, you mainly single pilot or you take a, another professional pilot with you? I, I fly a, a mainly single pilot. The only okay. time in the last year and a half, the only time I've had somebody else with me is when I've been doing mentor pilot flights. So yeah. for okay. me, uh, you know, getting single pilot type, typed was uh, the right move. And it's been, you know, it's been, it's worked out very well for me so far. Yeah, I know a lot of business people now, and I've said this before in, in other episodes of BizJet TV, um, there's a lot of people now thinking, well, you know what? I've always wanted to fly. So they may be playing around with Flight Simulator at home. Then they go down to the local flight school, get their private pilot's license, work their way up and buy an airplane. Even if it's a you know a small Sirius S22, start with that yeah. and move on to a turboprop, twin engine, and then get your jet. Um, but you know, there are more and more business people now because of the disruption in the airline industry. They're saying, you know, if I had my own airplane, I can fly it single pilot. It sits at the local airport and it's from my home. If suddenly I need to go somewhere, I can just fire up the jet and off I go. Um, and you control that situation. And yes. uh, there's more and more business people doing that today. Um, and I can see that train growing very nicely. Uh, the issue is always on the training as, as we've spoken about off camera, um, which is always a bit of bit of an issue. Now, obviously, you've been had all this success in the military, in business. You've got your own airplane. You're flying it yourself. And while all this has been going on, you've had time to uh, to have a family uh, <laughs> with kids. So tell us a bit about your family and and how your family have lived your 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 your, your career with you and and how you managed to balance those things out. Um, well, I'm 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 great. I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, I, I have. Uh, I'm fantastic wife who uh, she, she is gracious enough to say, I love your hobbies. Your hobbies take me to nice places. Okay, <laughs> so, that's she enjoys yeah, the private jet. Yeah, that's right. She does. And the daughters all uh, do as well. Um, I have, I have one daughter, uh, so five girls. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we are a blended family. My wife was, uh, was a widow and, and had two children. And so um, w with five daughters, uh, the, the fourth, uh, who is actually at university in the UK and Scotland, is the is the one who's always been absolutely fascinated with flying. And, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting. I, She's I, the next on the jet pilot then. She, yeah, I hope so. Um, but uh, the, it's funny. I'm starting to see some interest from uh, from our middle girl as well. Who's like, well, wait a minute. At some point, you won't do this anymore. And I like it. And so uh, she actually spoke up this year and said she was perhaps interested in learning to fly. Okay. Um, How old is she? How old is uh, she? She's 24, and, okay. you know, and, uh, and living in Boston. And I was able to go see her a couple weeks ago. But, you know, the, it's, it's funny. My, the, the first two, we would, I, you know, they'd be in their car seats and I'd start to taxi and they were both asleep. And I just thought that's what children did. They fell asleep when you taxied in a, in a plane. And then um, uh, the, the one daughter who's at, in at, at St. Andrews went I started flying with her. She was wide eyed, yeah. never fell asleep, asking a million questions, pointing to things from the earliest age. And I said, oh, this one's different. Matter of fact, my my most prolific video on YouTube is me flying with her going down. To, uh, she was home for holidays. Um, she hadn't been home for a year. She yeah. said, Dad, I'd love to go fly with you. Let's go down to Charleston, South Carolina and grab some lunch and just spend some time together. So we did. And uh, that seems to have resonated with the, the YouTube audience uh, better than the others. Uh, okay. But again, on that flight, a million questions. Why this aircraft? How it was different than the other planes we had flown? So uh, five daughters, all doing very well. San Francisco, Boston, um, uh, San Francisco, London, Boston, uh, Scotland, and, uh, and Michigan. Wow. Yeah. Good. So, so during your career, then, how have you managed to balance time at work with home and everything? And, and was it more difficult in the military compared to 
your 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 life now as, as well a, as a, the, mil the military has the the doesn't always accommodate geography right so mm -hmm. the military will take you away usually at very little notice and uh, put you in austere environments where it's very difficult to be a part of a family unit mm -hmm. um, technology has come a long way that's helped soften that a little bit but nothing makes up for you know being present and being yeah, available yeah. Uh, how i manage that not always not always well yeah. um uh, you know, but I, I, I try to listen. I, you know, I, I find my, I, I like to say that I'm coachable yeah. and, uh, you know, I do split my time between, you know, two different locations. And so, um, uh, having grown up as in a military family and had a career in my, I'm not from anywhere. I've moved so many times, uh, that it, it's, it's, I can't say that I'm from anywhere, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I do have a, uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm doing a flight, this Friday with my older brother, who was one of the early Apache pilots and probably the main reason I wound up in there. And he and I are flying up uh, to Northern Michigan where we have summer homes. We have summer homes there because we had a great, great grandfather who was a judge that thought beyond his own lifespan and, you know, and created something that we get to still enjoy today. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to head up there together and I'm, I'm going to film that one and see if I can turn around and get that published as well. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so that's uh, very very interesting. Um, so what um, what would be your recommendation to someone that's been watching or listening to this podcast and they want to yeah. get their own private airplane to fly it themselves, um, and they're thinking, well, how how am I going to get the money together? How can I make the millions to be able to afford this? What would your advice be to somebody that's got this kind of idea now and they probably landed on this episode of Budget TV or, or Quantum Action podcast to to sort of uh search for the answer to this question <laughs> what, well, what would your answer be yeah, so first of all if 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 you are researching this stuff it means you you have you have that burning desire inside if you find yourself up in the middle of the night and you're pulling on podcasts like this like i did with yours yeah <laughs> um that, that means that there there is that driving force in there and when yeah. we talk about that north star and that mission yeah. Um, that's that's what you have to see, but it's not at all cost, right? Being very intentional. Uh, I, as I talk to my daughters as they enter the workforce, I tell them look for three things: look for the culture of the company, and you get very difficult to know from the outside. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot that you can sort of in, indicators out there, but you'll know almost immediately when you arrive. Look for that culture, and then be a part of the culture. Be a part of making it better. Number two, are you doing something, you know, creative or disruptive? You know, uh, ex whatever that, whatever it is, I don't care if it's making donuts. I don't care if it's, you know, writing code or, you know, or, or, you know, using analytics to interpret, you know, financial data, you're doing something creative or disruptive. And then the last thing is your ability to make an impact. So if you look for those three things, it tends to line up to be uh, a successful endeavor. And, and then, bring bring your best right bring your best and it takes just an incremental amount of additional effort to really bring the best that you can listen to that feedback because you may think you're firing on all cylinders and bringing your a game but when you look around you people will be willing to give you that feedback if you need to redirect and then and then um you, you look for opportunity is there opportunity to to step up and do something different is there opportunity to improve what i'm doing uh, mm -hmm. there are folks out there that, that have, you know, different paths to success. I, you know, fan, there, there are, you know, family opportunities, there are geographical opportunities. Um, you know, for me, I'm fortunate that I had a family where the culture was one of service and one of, you know, of, of hard work. And I try to adopt that, but I, I find myself, you know, correcting my azimuth regularly mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not a one and done kind of thing and, and then i where where can i add value so culture creativity and the ability to make an impact or that are sort of those three legs of the stool that i look for to say is this a great opportunity to jump into add value deliver what you can and then uh, continue down that path yeah tim thank you very much for being on the show Absolutely. And uh, the links below to Tim's YouTube channel so you can watch him fly the Honda Jet. Thank and you. Uh, and uh, if you haven't already got yourself a copy of Quantum Action, which I understand, Tim, you're reading right now. I did. Uh, I did. 
get a copy of my latest book and we talk about the business jet world in there and you know the business of the future and the trends and that and if you haven't subscribed to the channel remember to subscribe give us a like and comment below we love the conversation and that's all from us here and we'll see you on the next one thank you